Okay, so we actually, uh, let's go back to Romans 5 and we'll just look at something that uh, came up last week. And, and the verbiage is kind of a little bit confusing on this, so that's why we should maybe spend a little time, not a lot of time, because it's, once you start to look at it, it's fairly simple. But let's take a, Romans 5.12. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. So 13 can sometimes get confusing because you're going, okay, then what does that really mean? If sin is not imputed because there is no law, then by default are men just justified? No. There was an answer of no. Can anyone expound on that? Now, let's take a look at this, okay? Um, let's look at some of the, the judgment of the Gentiles, because obviously we're taking a look at a situation where God is talking about before the law was presented and after the flood, okay? So he's talking about people, Gentiles, and those people that didn't have the law at the time. Take a look at Matthew 25, if you will. Matthew 25. We'll go down to verse 31. Talking about end times here, when the Lord is going to judge the Gentiles. So verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in glory in his glory, and in the whole and all the old holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungered, and ye gave me meat, I was thirsty, and when ye gave me drink, I was, for you gave me meat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we, saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee to drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in? or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Um, then shall he say unto those that are on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. What we see is the judgment of the Gentiles here, and the judgment is based on their works. Remember that was one of the judgments? One of the ways that their people are going to be judged? Take a look at Romans chapter 2, verse 11, and it becomes even clearer. Romans 2.11 For there is no respect of persons with God, for as many as have sinned without the law shall perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For, um, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, 
These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written on their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So the issue here is that, well actually, just go jump back to chapter 1 here, and, and we'll and leave you verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So we meet God in His justice, right? God is not going to unjustly judge somebody. What he looks at is he looks at what their knowledge is. Now watch. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. For God hath showed it unto them. So the issue here is that the human being knows the difference. That's why you hear people say, well, I don't believe in God. There's no evidence. I'm an atheist and so on and so forth, and I just don't believe. And that verse says no. You know there's a God. You know it, and you're actually going against it because it's just not convenient. The issue of judgment, then, is not the issue of judging according to the law, which would be unjust. If I said to a person, well, I'm going to judge you according to the Ten Commandments. You go, wait a second, I've never even heard of them. That's not justice. And that's where 513 comes in, where he says, if there... Go back to 513. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. In other words, the issue there is that they're not judged on the basis of the law that they didn't know. But they are judged on something, on the law that they do know. Right? And that's why you get in Matthew 25, they're saying, wait a second, when did I see you hungry? What? You know, I didn't, even, I didn't even know. But yet what they were doing was there was a law in their heart that they were following themselves. Okay? So the judgment, even though the law was not available to them, the judgment is one of they are law to themselves. Their conscience knows the difference. Um, take a look. There's some. So the issue there is pouring wrath. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Let's jump over there and we'll finish this off. 1 Corinthians 5. Verse 19. Some similar terminology here. Why am I saying 19 and there's no 19? Is that 2 Corinthians 5? Let me just see here. I, I may have typed it out wrong. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 5. 19. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. The issue there is the same as you see in 5.13, where you'll see the same word, not imputing the trespasses unto them. Here you've got not imputing when there is no law. The subject is different because what we're talking about here is, it, no, no, I shouldn't say that. The subject is the issue of, take, of pouring out wrath based on the law. Remember Israel, when they did wrong, they were chastised. They were judged under the law. You see? So there was a wrath pouring out. Now if I don't have the law, it wouldn't be very just of God to start pouring out of His wrath as He did on the nation of Israel, the law that I didn't know. But they will be judged on the law which is on their hearts because when we look back at Romans chapter 1 there, verse 18, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The issue is, they may hold this much truth, but that's what they'll be held accountable for. So, when we take a look at 
verse 13 in chapter 5, that's what's going on there. He said, he was not pouring out his wrath on the earth because they had no law. But yet, they sinned and they all did what? Verse 12, they all died. You see? For all have sinned. And that's the issue there. Because of our daddy, Adam, we all die. Right? So the issue is not pouring out wrath in a judgment where there is no law. So 5.13 is saying God is not unjust. He's not going to pour out wrath on people just because. And you have people who say that. You have people who say, you know, uh, I don't even know the difference. Or, you know, I... I why would God be punishing me and, and so on and so forth? And what's going on here in 13 is he's saying he wasn't pouring out his wrath based on the law, but he was pouring out his wrath. This, nevertheless, the judgment of death was upon all men. Yes, in a, in a sense, and that's why I brought up uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Of course, this is different because we're under grace at this point in time. And again, the reason that, the reason I brought up chapter 5 there, verse 19, is he is not pouring out wrath as he was under the law. Right? Once it, the law entered so that all would be guilty. Right? Remember that? So that, that sin became exceedingly sinful, the, the scripture said. So the issue there was knowledge was put out so he could hold everybody accountable, right? Now, by, by in the day of grace, what do we start off with? And we're going to we're gonna start in, in chapter 6, so we may as well is uh, getting into there. And we start off, Romans chapter 1, and in verse 18, saying wrath, right? Because where do we meet God? And his justice. That's where we meet him. Okay? Uh, so go to chapter 6. We'll start in chapter 6. Does that make sense? That, that should clarify 13 at least. That it wasn't the issue of, well, did they somehow, were they somehow not guilty? They were guilty of the amount of information they had. Okay? So that's where the judgment is. God is not going to overjudge somebody. He's not going to say, well, you should have known. He's going to say, this is what you know. And you knew the difference, and yet you didn't call out to me. And I made myself manifest to you. So that's what's going on there, okay? So let's uh, get, get right into chapter 6 here. So we now move in chapter 6, verse 1. We now move from the issue, the issue of justification, what we did is, in chapters 1 through to uh, 3.20, there was the judgment of man. All men have sin, and all men are unworthy. So you have the, accus the accusation where everybody's put on the same level. He takes the religious, he takes the non-religious, he takes the whole group and says, listen, you're all the same. Right? Remember, he famously says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, in, uh, in verse 11 of chapter 3, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh good. And then he goes down, their throat is an open sepul sepulcher, their tongues are, they use deceit, the poison of asps under them. So he just really hits hard the issue that there is nobody righteous, except for Christ. Then he goes through, and in chapters 3 to 5, we talk about justification. And we just went through chapter 5, we had justification and all the benefits. That was a fantastic chapter. All the benefits that are given because you're justified. Not because you did anything, but because of everything that he's done. Right? There's two sides to that story. That takes the onus off of me. I didn't earn anything. He did it all on the cross. Then I went through chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. 
And it says, because you're justified, you have this and this and this. And he just goes down through those things. And now I'm left again without an excuse. But I'm left with all of the power that is given through justification. Now, we leave the issue of justification. And we now have met God's justice requirements because of Christ. We have met them, and, it, and there's nothing, we have to add nothing to it, okay? And on top of that, on chapter 5, was the issue of because all the work is done by Christ, we have eternal security. You can't lose that. Why can't you lose it? You didn't do anything for it. You trusted what He did, and it's all of Him. Whew, that's great. Because I don't have to now be, you know, how many people say, oh, well, yeah, you're saved, but you better do this, and you better, you better go up and do this little ritual, and you better watch what you're doing, because you know what? God's only got so much patience with you. But chapter 5 goes through and says, no, no, no. So hopefully by the end of chapter 5, we've all gotten that you cannot, absolutely not, under any circumstances, lose your salvation. Does everybody get that? Yes. Get that? No matter what you do. Can't out -sin huh? can't out -sin grace. You can't out sin grace. What's the last? The... What is, so the conclusion after chapter 5. In verse 1 of chapter 6. Take a look at chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The obvious conclusion, if I understand grace properly, is, well then it doesn't matter what I do. Right? That's the obvious conclusion. Now, that on the surface might shock some people and go, what are you saying? But the point is, you now understand what grace does. That's what grace does. So let's, let's read verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God protests. God says, wait a minute. Do you know what I had to do because of this sin? Do you know what I did? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? The issue in verse 3 is identification. You were immersed, you were put in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In essence, what happened to Christ happened to you supernaturally. Thank goodness you didn't have to go through what he went through. But supernaturally, that's what happens there. Okay? Um, we can take a little bit more, uh, a deeper look at that in a second. The issue with that justification that I just want to jump back for a second here, is that justification is that the, the issue of the wrath has stopped. There are still people who believe and who think, well, maybe I've done something wrong. Maybe, maybe my actions in life, maybe this is why things are going bad for me. Maybe, you know, they're always looking at that. Maybe I displeased God. If you've ever had that thought, you understand after going through chapter 5 here, that's impossible. Why? I'm 100% freely, what? Justified. Right? I'm saved by faith, as chapter 4 says. I'm saved by faith plus, what? Nothing. 
We have to get that before we can get into the sanctification process. I think everybody's got it by now. But what happens is that the justification by grace through faith amplifies that cross work of Christ. It gives us that position in heavenly places. Remember in Ephesians, he has, given, he has blessed us with all blessings in heavenly places. It gives us that position in Christ. When? Out here? No. The moment that you're saved. That takes all our excuses away too. From chapter 6 through to 8, what we're going to start to cover is we're going to start to cover the sanctification process. So we got through the justification, 6, 7, and 8, is how we're going to see how that sanctification process happens based on that justification. The issue of the dominion of sin comes up. The issue that sin is no longer guilt but rather it's a power or an influence on our life and how we handle that. Because if sin is guilt, that goes back to I'm not justified. I need to do something. I need to, I keep going back to that guilty state. But if I start to understand that no, no, I'm fully justified because of the cross work of Christ, what I have now is I have an issue where sin separate from me has an influence on me. Okay, and I need to understand that. And that's what we're going to be going through in 6 to 8. It's not, sin is no longer a reigning thing in my life. Before I was saved, sin did reign in my life. Remember in chapter 5, we went through that. Let's go back to um, verse 19, chapter 5, uh, verse 18, verse 17. <laughs> For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men into condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of the one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness, unto or until all the way to eternal life. In other words, from that moment to eternity. So just as sin has re had reigned before in our lives and we had no choice, now grace reigns. Now you're backed off from it. And you're looking at this force and you're going, that's sin, but that's not me. And we're going to go through, and Paul is going to look into that in depth in the next three chapters. So now what we need to do is, understanding the justification, we have to understand that we have a new way to live now. It's completely different. And this, the world just completely misses. They, you can't even talk to them about this. They just completely misunderstand this. Now the issue is not guilt, shame, and so on and so forth, but the issue now is your daily walk. You're not walking after the flesh. You're not walking based on your memory of this is what I used to do. This is my memory. This is how I was raised. This is what my past. You're not walking as a slave to your sinful flesh and going, I have no choice. And we're going to go into that in more depth as we go through chapter 6 here. But we walk now after the Spirit. So now this, the issue is that the Spirit has, has 
baptized us, has put us into Christ. He has identified it with us with Christ, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to see how that affects our life. Okay? Previous to this, we had no power over the sinful flesh. And this is why you often hear people in the world talk about 12-step, uh, disease, uh, the issue is sin is a disease, and so on and so forth. And certainly sin has a disease effect. But they'll put it in such a way that you have no choice, and it will always have that power over you, and you've got to fight it every day. You've got to get up, you've got to fight this, and, and that battle of fighting sin. But in your justification and in your sanctification, that's not how it works at all. And if you have that, what you're going to do is you're going to be constantly looking at your sinful flesh and going, you see, your sinful flesh now is a reflection of who you are without Christ. Who you were outside of Christ. That's all. Not you. And that's what happens. You're now separated from that. And it is now a power and a force, but it's not you anymore. It is not reigning in your life because you're now under grace and that's what is now reigning. And we're going to go through that. Your position in Christ now affects your daily walk. How you look at yourself. What you do in your daily life. And... and What's important there is that you understand that there are so many people say, well, you know, yeah, but when I get to heaven and I get a new body, then, then I'll be free from sin. That's not, that's, that's not how grace works. It worked from the moment you were saved. And, but if you don't understand that premise, you're going to believe that. Okay, why? Because that's the way I used to be. It's now different. So, the issue now is it's practical, it's experiential. It is something that I do on a daily basis as I understand who I am in Christ. I stand on that and, and I practice it in, in essence by doing it over and over and over and over. And now it becomes habit for me. Now I'm undoing the habits that my flesh is so subject to and has done all its life. Most of the behaviors that we do is because we saw someone else do it or we did it over and over and over and now we think, oh, well, that's who I am. Well, certainly your flesh operates that way. But because you're justified, you don't operate that way. It's completely different. See, justification, you are declared positionally righteous by imputed righteousness. You are declared positionally righteous. That's what justification did. It said you are righteous. All right? Sanctification takes that, that imputed righteousness and it starts to work it out in your daily life. That's what's meant by work out your own salvation. Okay? It starts, you start to live it. You start to act on it. A new believer who doesn't have a lot of religious influence gets this very quickly. I've noticed. I asked a new believer today, and they said, well, you just live it. Because that's who you are. Huh? Didn't leave a lot of teaching there. They got it. Unfortunately, for those of us who have been raised in a very religious society, we're constantly fighting with all kinds of ideologies and, and things that contradict that. And I find most believers who fall for this, it's because they weren't, they don't have this word working in them. They've gone to 
this church and that church and this church, and they've had all these application messages about, well, you better get to the altar, and you better confess your sin, and you better do this, and you better not do this. Did I hear this? And, you know, sister so-and-so told me this about you. You know, and, and on and on, and you just, I don't know where to put myself half the time. And what happens is that the believer who simply says, you mean I just live it? loses that. And they lose it to a whole bunch of religious ideology and shame. And they get put back under the performance system of the law. And that's what the law was, right? Why, why was the law given? What did it say in chapter 5? Moreover, verse 20, moreover the law entered that the offense might <laughs> abound. See, what happened here is it took a man who thought he was self-righteous and he started to do it and he kept failing. And he realized, wait a second, I'm not righteous at all. I'm a failure. And that law kept pointing. You need to perform harder. You need to perform harder. And every time you failed, then you felt ashamed and you felt guilt. And you're under that performance system. And then you just give up on yourself. And you say, but when you start to understand that you're justified 100% by the cross work of Christ, nothing of myself, and when I start to add to it, what happens? I mess it up every time. As soon as I try to take that righteousness and say it's me that's doing it or I should be doing it, I'm going to mess it up and I'm going to be back under this. And that shame is going to happen. And believers are going to give up. Because of that justification, you're fully equipped for that righteousness being reflected in your daily life. You're fully equipped. You have, you have uh, pastors, teachers, the assembly, the word of God, the renewed. You have everything you need to operate that way. You have fully equipped. Okay? See, grace, what grace does is it stabilizes your life under any circumstance. But your flesh doesn't, does it? What's your flesh do? Your flesh responds to events in your life and you lose it. Ever do that? I've never done that myself. <laughs> Chapter 6, you're dead to sin. Chapter 7, you're dead to something else. You're dead to the law. And chapter 8, you're alive unto God. That's how that sanctification process is going to happen. Chapter 6, 7, and 8. You need to go through that process based on that justification. Now you can operate on the sanctification. If you didn't get the justification properly, though, we couldn't even talk about stuff in chapter 6, 7, and 8. See that? It's all sequential in the way Paul has written that and is designed to operate and bring you to that next level of stability. Okay? Six one says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Hold your hand there and compare that to chapter 3.8 and you're going to see something. Go to chapter 3. Verse 8, if you understand and teach grace properly, you're going to be accused of something. Look at verse 8, and not rather as we slanderously be reported and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Verse 1, chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, God forbid. God protests. God hates sin. Never 
will he tolerate it, and nor should you in your life. And you have no reason to because you're saved and justified by the cross work of Christ and you've been given everything. You just need to start walking in it. You just need to start living it. See? God hates sin. He didn't save us to sin. He didn't save us to go, oh, well, whatever, I'm saved anyway. That's not. He didn't go through the, the torment, torture on the cross and everything that he went to through all his life so that you could just sin. He didn't seal you with his Holy Spirit so that you could bring his Holy Spirit in to sin. That's, that's not God. People, well, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. You'll hear people say that. Slanderously, they say that we should sin that grace may abound. It's okay. There'll be more grace anyway. You also don't need to quit sinning to be saved or confess your sin or go to Mass or do any of those things. That is a direct violation of grace salvation. You understand that? When you start putting works in and saying, I've got to be sorry for my sin, what's happening is you're taking it back. You're saying, I'm unjustified. I'm under the power of this thing, sin. I can't help myself. I've got to confess it. There's a whole religion of uh, Scientology. It's all based on make yourself feel good by confession. It's, there's a lot of religions that will actually do that. I mean, of course, you have Catholicism doing the same thing. What's the point of that? That takes you out of the cross work of Christ and starts to put the onus back on me. That's what it does. So am I justified anymore? Nope. At that moment, I lost it. I don't believe it. Now, I'm not saying you're literally unjustified. What I'm saying is, that's how you view yourself, not as a justified being. Okay? If that were so, then why would Paul say, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to say that grace may abound? That's the whole point of why Paul says it. He says, did you get what I said? You're justified fully by grace. There's nothing you can do to lose it. It's party time. Go to uh, chapter 11. You hold your hand here. We're coming back. Chapter 11 for a second. We're Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more works. For if, if it be by, great, by works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. Paul separates the difference completely. Understand one thing here, folks. He's making this separation because back here it was a works-oriented system. It was, you, you sinned, you had to do what? Come up with a proper sacrifice. Better go to the priest. He'll tell you what to do. And you better do it. And he's saying, no, it's the exact opposite. It's no longer by what you do. It's no longer by the works of the law. It's by grace. You've got to keep that in your head because it will always want to try to get out and your pride will always want to come in and your pride wants to take over and go, but I don't want to make my own sacrifice to the Lord. Remember Cain? Didn't work out so well for him, did it? There are two popular attitudes towards sin. Two of them. First one could be called sinful subjection. And that is basically saying, well, I've got to sin a little bit. I can't help it. 
I'm human. All right? You get some religious folks to do that. Well, you can't help it. Just come to the altar and you confess that sin. You can't help yourself. That's, that's what we call fatalism. And it's fatalism to your justification. That's what it is. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Hopefully I got the first and second read right this time. 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. That's interesting, because I've heard a lot of Christians say, but you don't understand, I'm under, I'm like Job, man. I'm under so much pressure, I can't, I, you, I'm a believer. You don't have to go through what i got to go through. And Paul says, uh-uh-uh, you can't use that excuse. There is nothing that is that you go through that is not common to any other man. Did, you notice he didn't say believers? He said all men. But God is faithful. Oops, now we're going to have a problem. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye are able to bear it. You know what that means? That's KJV talk for a year without an excuse. He's, he's, no matter what the temptation, he will give you an escape from the temptation. And you are not tempted any more than anybody else. So don't say I've had it harder than somebody else. It's not harder than anybody else. We've all gone through the exact same thing. But you don't understand. No. He says, no, -uh. God is faithful. He will not allow that to happen. You do not have a situation where Satan is going, yep, I see your uh, believer down there, but if you give me a chance, I'll take care of him. You're not Job. That's not what you do. There is no temptation that is taking you that is not common to all men. The excuse is gone. You will never get to the judgment seat of Christ and say, but I just had to commit that sin. You won't. There's no sin that you have to commit. You have all the resources. You have the word, you have teachers, you have pastors, you have the assembly, you have godly friends, you know who they are. You have everything. He is faithful and he has provided an escape of the situation. You even have a cell phone. Yes. Brother Bob, I need help. <laughs> See, the old saying is, the problem is not with God, then it must be with you. Then no doubt the problem is with me. The issue, as I said before, is that grace shows me, my flesh, who I am. It makes me dependent on Him. Remember we went through tribulation chapter 5? Right? And what does tribulation do? We now depend on Christ even more. When I am weak, what's the verse say? Then am I strong. Why? Because I'm no longer depending on my flesh and my weakness, but I depend on Him. And the more I'm doing that every day, and I'm realizing I'm living that out, I am working out my own salvation. That's what that means. <clears throat> so
So what's important in the way that I look at my life is not who I am, because who I am is oftentimes going to say, well, this is who I was, this is how I was raised up, this is the influence of my life, da-da-da. No, what's important is who am I in Christ, who He's made me. I'm justified. He's given me all this. The second popular attitude that would come up is that I, I no longer have a sin nature, so I cannot sin. It's just silly, but I've heard people say it. I don't sin, not because I don't sin, but everything that I do, God doesn't look at sin, so I'm not sinning anyway. You ever heard that? One day, God's going to take away all my desire to sin. It's just going to all go away. So I'm just waiting, just waiting around here, and eventually, you know, I'll be a sinless creature. No. 1 John 1 8. Hold your hand here, we're coming back. 1 John 1 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, then we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Sin is in our flesh. It's there. You have everything that you need to not sin. You're not being tempted past your ability to resist it and do something else. So denying that you're doing wrong is not, is not the other option. Denying that you don't have a flesh that has a sin nature is also ridiculous. Because it's going to be there. But is that you? That's the question. Is that you? What's the answer? No. It's not me. But I do have a flesh. It does desire it. Do I have the power over that? Yes. I'll read you this quote. To say that I must sin is to deny the foundation of Christian truth. To say that I cannot sin is to deceive myself. To say that I need not sin is to state a divine privilege. And we've all been given that privilege as believers. I need not sin. Verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The issue is living in sin and making excuses as to why it's okay. It's not okay. It never was okay. It never will be okay. Grace did not negate truth and righteousness. It didn't say, well, that doesn't matter anymore. That's not I've heard, I don't know how many times, well, we're not under the law, we're under grace. <laughs> no, God forbid. God protest. God will not tolerate sin now, never has, never will. Romans, uh, let's go to, uh, I got here, verse 3. Know ye not, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. No, notice that. No, there. Go up to verse 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. There are some things you need to know. You need to know verses 3 to 10 are going to... Let's read 3 to 10. Know ye not... 
that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. But if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, and in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. You need to know that. Next thing you need to know is to reckon yourself that way. Verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be, read it out loud, dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. That is reckoning, and the next verse that you need to know let, verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You see the attitude change I'm allowed to take? I'm able to take that because of that justification. I'm able to put that flesh, and that sinful flesh, and that sin nature that has been separated from me, and I'm able to take a look at that and go, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That is the, the ability... That salvation and justification in Christ gave me, it gave me that ability to take that flesh, put it out there, and go, but that's not me, and I will not give in to it. God forbid. I'm dead to that. But I'm alive in Christ. You cannot dig a hole, you cannot create a hole in nature without filling it with something. Even if you dig it, air comes in and takes its place. It, something has always got to go there. And if you've got a sin nature and you say, no, what you have to do is, I'm dead to that, but I'm alive to something else. Otherwise, you're going to be a slave to your flesh. Okay? You weren't able to do that before you were justified. You couldn't do that. You could say that. But you couldn't do that. Take a look at uh, verse 3 again. Verse 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Wherefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. The issue there, folks, is that word baptized gets often mixed up with water. Because the first thing anyone, you say baptism with water, first thing that comes to your mind, why? Because we're constantly told that that's what baptism is. Water. Water. If you put the, you understand how the whole concept of holy water and all that came along? They've got a guy on TV, what's his name, uh, some TV preacher guy, Copeland I think it, it is, who's selling holy water, and if you buy it, it's going to make you holier. You see where he, what he's doing is he's taking something like this, and he's saying that that baptism is water, and that water makes you holy. Okay? So you can understand why people rush to get their babies baptized real quick. 
You can also understand why religious organizations who want to build up their, their, their uh, churches and so on and so forth will want to get all their people as holy as possible and get them into a baptismal. Can I tell you that that has nothing to do with water? Well, that water's not in there. Take a look at um, well, Ephesians 1, Ephesians chapter 1. So is the baptism all the spirit? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 1. In fact, that's exactly what we're going to read. chapter 1 verse 13 in whom ye also trusted after that sorry let everybody get there I'm starting to rush in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of the truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise that baptism is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that is what seals you. Okay? Not water. Water can't do that. However, how many saw, I used to hear, I would hear songs all the time. Well, uh, they baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. You know that one? Okay. Yeah? No, I won't sing it. I start to run through my head after, and then I'll get to think that song you don't mind. Right? They baptized Jesse Taylor to Cedar Creek last Sunday. The words go, and, and, and Jesus gained a soul, and Satan lost a good right arm. Wow, that's pretty good power on water, right? You have, uh, the other one is uh, Pray for the Fish. Everyone ever heard that, Randy Travis? The guy goes to get baptized, gets baptized in water, and he said all the sin started coming out and the water started bubbling and the fish were dying. Pray for the fish. Now that gets kind of funny and silly. But understand where that thinking is coming from. That somehow that the priest or the preacher, by putting you in water, somehow supernaturally seals you and, and turns you into a holy person. You see how against uh, how that water would become so fantastically important and how all of a sudden the baptism of the Holy Spirit means what? There's only one baptism. So either water has that power and that's the baptism you need or it's the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians twelve. First Corinthians twelve. We're going to take, keep looking at the at the baptism issue here. First Corinthians twelve, verse thirteen. We said there was one baptism, right? You just read that, right? There's not two, right? How many baptisms are there in Scripture? Anybody know? There's a lot. Be like, uh, I've heard anywhere from 7 to 12, depending on, on what people look at. But there's more than just one. Okay? Take a look at verse 13. For by one Spirit we are all... Read that out loud. Baptized. Oh, baptized what? In the one body. Is that water there? Spirit. The issue... 
issue back to chapter 6, you want to flip back to chapter 6 here, the issue of the word baptized here is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He did it. Okay? You didn't do it. He did it. You're not keeping yourself safe. He's done it. You're sealed until when? The day of redemption. Okay? The issue here is that you are now identified supernaturally. Whatever Christ went through, you were baptized and you were put into that. And it's whatever has happened to him, happened to you. So that, that issue there, baptized, is could best be described as, as a living union, a, a, an immersion into Christ. You don't do that with water. It's done with spirit. Okay? Galatians chapter 3. We're going to finish off pretty quick here. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 26. Galatians 3, 26. For we, ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Grace doctrine, right? You believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. By faith, you are now a child of God. For as, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have been put in Christ. I'm sorry? What did I say? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I'm sorry. I that. So we, huh? so here's, for 27, for as many yes. of you has have, been, have been baptized into Christ, so saved, justified, justified. Have, have put on Christ. So that is the sanctification process. Yes, yes, yes. You see how that links back to verse 3 and 4 here in chapter 6? Yeah. See, how, see that link? Romans chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, by baptism. That's how you got there. Can you see? Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. How did you get in the spirit? How did you get in there? We just read it. You were baptized in the spirit. That's how you got in. You couldn't buy your way in. Right? You couldn't walk in. Now you have the spirit of God. You're sealed in him. Now you have the ability that God can speak to you in the spirit of your mind, and he, Christ can live all through you. You see how that spirit happens? Before you had that spirit, that you couldn't do that. The world listens to this stuff, and they go, you're nuts. Why? Because they don't have the spirit of God. Verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, what? It doesn't work with the world. You can't take this and have it operate a non-believer. You cannot expect a non-believer to have power over the sin in his life. Why? You see? That this is a common error in society. we got to change the sin in society. we got to have policies and politics. And we got to do this and, and get the Ten Commandments back in school. You couldn't keep the Ten Commandments to begin with. You never could. What's that going to do? The point is, you're not here to change the way the world functions. You're here to change, to bring that gospel in, to work in that per, in that person's life, to bring him to salvation. And if you're not bringing him to salvation, and you're not using the plan that Paul sets forth in the book of Romans, where he says, you're all guilty. If you go, well, you know, God's love, and you know... As long as you believe in a God somewhere. That's a worldly kind of thing. As long as you believe in some sort of God, your higher power, right? 
That's all you need. Whatever you perceive to be God. Well, I perceive that light bulb to be God. There you go. See? It's God. No. It, you've got to be, we've got to be faithful to the gospel. And if you're covering that over and sugaring that, you know, sugarcoating that, you're not being faithful to grace. And then what's grace, what's grace avail anybody if they're not guilty of anything anyway? What are you being saved from? And they say, well, you know, don't talk to people about sin. They had a, they had this thing where they, they had somebody in Anglican Church, I believe it was, in England, and the guy said, well, you need to teach these kids in Sunday school about sin. And the parents covered the ears of their children and they ran them out of the church. <laughs> right? Don't you talk to my child like you're going to traumatize them. No, you're going to make sure they're lost. Truth is truth. That's, the truth is what's important. That's what it's about. So when you trusted Christ, when you believed trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you realize that I am a sinner, I am guilty, and I'm going to meet God in His justice one day. And there's not a ritual in the world that can save me from that. There's no amount of money. I can't Bill Gates my way out of this and give a billion dollars here and a hundred million dollars there. The rich man's not going to make it. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, you were placed in you in living union. You were baptized into Christ. That's the only baptism that's worth anything. I have found that unless the religious organization brings up the subject of water baptism, not one believer will ever say, I think I'm missing something. I need, I don't know, what is it? They'll never come up and go, I, I believe, I, you know, the Lord's told me I need to be back. No. Unless you bring it up, that's not something that they're going to come up with. And the reason they're not going to come up with it is because it's already been done. And their spirit knows it. And it's extremely important that you don't take, you don't water down the spirit. You don't want to be doing that. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We want to reflect on that for the rest of until the next Bible study, just reflect on that. My flesh is dead to sin. I don't need to sin. I never did. What I need to do is to realize who I am in Christ, that I'm a justified being. Sin should have no part in your life. Zero. It should be totally absent absent because God has no tolerance for it. That's why he died on the cross. Zero tolerance as a believer. And if you're not a believer, and if somehow you've been listening to all this stuff and you've never made a decision for Christ to this moment, all you've got to do, you don't need to come up, you don't need to cry, you don't need to weep and wail, you don't need to give money. What you need to do is say, I trust your death, burial, and resurrection, Lord. You do that right where you're sitting. You don't have to close your eyes. You don't even have to pray. God hears you where you sit. Grace has fixed you so that you can see who you really are. And that's something that you need to really focus. Focus on that verse 6, chapter 6, verse 6. And you know what? Come up, look at those verses, chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. And, and, and study it out and see what other reasons that can't be water baptism. I think we've covered quite a few that it can't be. It's either one or the other. There's only one baptism and we're baptized.
baptized by the Holy Spirit the moment we trust Christ. So I got a, I got a conflict. Right? We're done. Okay. Close the word. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Your Word. We thank Thee for the sanctification uh, process that You are working in us. We ask that You would make it first and foremost in our thinking as we go through our daily lives from this point on to realize that we're dead to sin and we're, we're putting, baptized in living union with you, Lord. And thank you for, for that justification and sanctification. It's not meant, it's not about us having to do something, but you've done it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.